Dear Greg, we're the program coordinator. Online with us, we have our head of department, Dr. Shalyan Wilson, as well as the local CIS coordinator, Mr. Geoffrey Edwards. And here with us in person, the director of the program, Ms. Shulan Cabrales. Um, the presentation is being recorded, so you will get the session later on. For the persons who are joining us virtually, thank you for participating. If you have any questions, please place them in the chat. They will be fielded from the chat. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of Mr. Gerd Michael Dambowski, who is the Senior Diversity and Anti-Discrimination Manager at FIFA. He is going to present on the topic diversity and anti-discrimination in sport, a FIFA case study. We ask that, we always ask questions, how is FIFA dealing with these matters? And I'm sure Michael will answer some of these questions that you may have. So let me give you a detail, some, a brief description of Michael's background and experience. Michael is a German sociologist sports scientist, social worker, and publisher of various essays and books on social fan culture and social responsibility with a view to anti-discrimination, violence, and hooliganism, social minorities, and conflict mediation. His current work focuses on diversity and anti-discrimination at FIFA competitions, at national football associations, and at FIFA as an organization. Gerd is, Gerd is mainly responsible for a FIFA Good Practice Guide on Diversity and Anti-Discrimination, and among other projects, he ensures the implementation of the anti-discrimination monitoring system and three-stepped procedure for discriminatory incidents at FIFA competitions. The FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022 core stakeholder group on inclusion and anti-discrimination, diversity and anti-discrimination training elements for FIFA, match officials, and workforce at FIFA competition. He is also an appointed member of the German Academy for Football, Culture, and represents FIFA in the working group of the Daniel Nevelle Foundation to support fans' dialogue and the prevention of violence in French and German football. I am certain Jed will go more in depth into his background and experience throughout his presentation. So we are very happy to have Jed with us finally in person. And I welcome Jed to the podium, or to present. Let's welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and first of all, um, I'm very grateful to be able to speak to you here today after two years and more of COVID, and uh, especially being here to to speak to you so closely also to your Independence Day. It's, it's a good link to the topic. Um, I'm very grateful to be here and thank you for the invitation to CIS and to the university. Um, let's see where we can go today. And, and I, was pre I was prepared to do so anyway, but after my preparation call with Sherlin, with uh, Kalicia and with Joffrey, I was thinking even more to kind of prepare something on why should you even listen here to an old white European man probably even heterosexual, talking about diversity and anti-discrimination. Like, what, what gives me the position to do so, apart from my professional um, experience, let's say? Well, I've, I started to write a page, and then it became 10 pages. I cut it down to three pages. It's still way too long, and it sounds kind of presumptuous sometimes, I think. I never did that before, but anyway, I was introduced as a German sociologist. I identify myself as someone with a German passport, let's say. Um, my parents come from, from, from Poland. They are official refugees in Germany when they came. Um, my grandfather is Romanian. There's a lot of Eastern European roots. My parents, when they came to Germany, they identified so badly as being German 
because when they were in Poland, they were called the Schwab, which is a derogatory term for German heritage. Now, like they can call us whatever, but we can feel as Germans, although we have Polish roots. But then they called them the Polaken, which is a derogatory term for Polish roots mixed with some, some German ancestry. And that kind of like says a little bit about what like yeah, perception means, what identity means. When I grew up, for example, and we felt, uh, played football in the backyard, the Germans would say, today we play Germans against Polaken, which is the Polish people. And that included also Turkish migrants, a huge minority in Germany. So we played against the German kids, always. And for us, that was a big chance, because football sometimes really proves that it can do so many things. And sometimes when we won and I walked home with my Turkish friends, some of these German kids waited for us. And we were like eight, eight, between eight and 12 years old. They captured us. They put us in a basement, in a cellar, for a few hours to be punished because we, we, we beat them. And they threw urine at us. They, they humiliated us in, in many different ways. And that is my, my German passport situation. I don't really, like that sticks with me. And if I wouldn't have chosen this way that I have chosen, I'm an activist for 30, more than 30 years in anti-fascism inside and outside football, but mainly in football. If I wouldn't continue following this path, I would still feel in that dungeon back then when they put me there. But that doesn't mean that I'm not, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't want to like, like the pain that I had, and then sometimes I'm still reminded, I'm, I'm like always feel insecure when I'm somewhere, like now. That doesn't mean that, that my pain like kind of outweighs any other pain or someone else's pain. Like it, it's, it's a pain that, that is a standalone pain. And it doesn't need to be compared. It doesn't even need to be any, uh, it doesn't even need to have any, any real scientific term. I don't want to compare myself to anything, but I, I think I have a certain glimpse of what it means uh, to be discriminated. Although I don't like that term because I'm a white, old European man from Europe. But sometimes it's a little bit more complex. And, 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 and I think uh, there's much more. And then, if you're interested, I can give you the whole paper at some point, but I decided somehow not to do it. But it, it, what is important is I, it also means constantly reflecting white privilege. Because I was an activist, which was a choice, because I could hide behind my white skin. Right? Whenever I use the terms black and white, I mean black with a capital B and, and white with a capital W because to kind of mark that these are social constructions of race that are very functional in, re in reality, so they are real, but, but there is no biological backup for this. But anyway, um, reflecting white privilege is very important because I'm working for FIFA for eight years now. I'm working in the Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination Department which wasn't existing when I got there. When I, when I got to FIFA, there was one banner, say no to racism, you will see it in the videos, that was there and there was a task force working on anti-discrimination and that's basically why I was hired. And I can, I can, I can confirm or I, like, I really would like to, you to believe that if, if there would not be progress in the last eight years, I would not be there anymore. I, it was a choice to become an activist, of course. I could have hidden behind my white color, let's say. But um, I choose the other path. I choose the other path, but did I, did I, did I uh, benefit from my white privilege? Yes, because I'm working for eight years for FIFA. That's, that's pretty clear, right? So I fell back into this. And it somehow happened to me, but it didn't happen with reflection, with a constant idea of how can I do more? How can I challenge? the frameworks, how can, how can we do more to break glass ceilings, how can we unify experiences of discrimination 
from many different ways in the world. I've learned so much since I'm with FIFA about, for example, how racism functions in local China, which is completely different than probably here or in Western Europe. So um, there's, there's many, many different ways of, of how people can get discriminated. I don't count really myself as one. I just have a certain glimpse, I would say. And I have a professional background and I'm working in this area, let's say, for more than 30 years. Always, it was always difficult because when I started, there was also nothing in Europe. Like I, I was always at the table when certain networks were founded back then. So I'm a founding member, for example, of the FAIR network, which is one of the most renowned um, anti-discrimination networks in Europe, but also now worldwide. And many, many other tables, I was there when it happened. And, and, and uh, there is, I, I, that's what I am. I, I cannot stop doing that. And I also have to stop, uh, continue fighting this fight for, for my son, who will at some point most likely define himself as black as well. Um, and I will fight this wife, not at the very end, the last but not least, but not really. Uh, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, like in the very forefront, also for my wife who is, who is from Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, she, since she came to Switzerland, she experienced a lot of racism, which is much more subtle than it was when I grew up, like in the 80s and in the 90s, when you, when you really had like far-right boneheads, not calling them skinheads, but far-right boneheads who really beat myself up when I went to demonstrations, who beat myself up quite a lot of times when we were trying to protect squats, like we were squatting houses to kind of create safe places for not only ethnic minorities but also for, for LGBTQI plus people, as we call them now at FIFA. So that's, that's for the background, I would say, um, which to me is exp uh, important and, and now I said, well, I wouldn't be here if there would not be progress. Let's see, you can decide by yourself. I think there's, there's always more that needs to be done. It's not enough, it's never enough. Because the, when we are talking about certain abbreviations that are political correct right now, they will, won't be political correct in five years anymore, or in 10 years, but maybe even in five years. So I don't really do much today about definitions. I use abbreviations quite sloppy let's say and um, I'm also not entitled to speak so much about women's football because there is a women's football division who do the development there's an investment about 1 billion US dollars into women's football over a cycle of four years which means development of football it means also of course making um, uh, uh, money for, for winning a tournament higher, like price money higher, but it mainly means investment. And there is a women's strategy. Maybe I will have time to show the video later on. I'm also not talking so much about accessibility, barrier-free stadiums. That's also my, some of my colleagues doing that work. I'm also not talking so much about workers' welfare. That's the topic at the moment when we are talking about the World Cup in Qatar where the World Cup is in a country of, let's say, two to three hundred thousand Qataris f facing about two to three million migrant workers. And it's a big topic, of course. Um, there is a lot about this. If, if people are interested, I can definitely pass a, pass a dossier about what my colleagues are doing. Of course, my work is cross-cutting with that. But I'm much more working on tournaments, let's say, and direct operational anti-discrimination and diversity at tournaments, but also advising member associations who are seeking us for advice, and sometimes also we are reaching out. So let's, let's dig a little bit deeper. So that's the structure for today. I talk a little bit about organizational structure first, then um, our strategic approach. There's already a, a typo, I can tell. Um, we have a five pillar strategy. You will find out more about this in a minute. Um, we, I will talk about my work at, at FIFA competitions uh, and also with FIFA member associations in general. So to say, I will not read out every slide. It kind of borders me. I get often carried away. So I might start walking around at some point 
and talk freely. I know it is, uh, it is recorded. I'm sometimes very critical as a change maker working in this area. You have to be critical against or with your company all the time. Otherwise, you cannot introduce change. But um, yeah, I hope we can have also maybe a debate later on if you still have time. And please contact me at any point. There will be my email at, uh, in the end of the presentation. So organizational structure. I'm, I already said I'm working in the, in the human rights uh, and anti-discrimination department. But at FIFA in general, we have um, 828 people working in Zurich at the moment. That's only Zurich headcount. And the 812, you can, that, that means full-time staff. So there's full-time and part-time staff. People, people like sum it up and say, OK, if you, if you count in full-time staff, you would say 812.1 full-time. But headcount is the most important to see here. Um, you can also see um, women's and men's um, split. I cannot see it because my eyes are not very well, but it must be a little bit over 50% for men and a little bit under 50, um, yeah, 40 to 60 at the moment. It was better before. Um, it's also getting better like, because you see that and you, people are in Europe quite surprised that at least there are 40% women. But it could mean that women are working the shitty jobs, right? And this is not the case, it's getting better and better. Like the chief that I had was a, was a, was a, was a female, for example, like women in decision-making power. Uh, we have Fatma Samura as uh, the first black um, sec uh, secretary general at FIFA from, from Senegal working right now. And that also kind of escalates down or cascades down to more and more positions. We are not there yet, I would say, but it's getting better and better. Um, then uh, we also have networks that are organized by employees. And that kind of is a very important thing. People are not only doing the work for, for the money, but they are also doing the work because they feel like being a certain community. And I, I would like to uh, point out, of course, the women's network, which was a network when I came to FIFA. It kind of worked more or less underground without any official budget from FIFA, inviting speakers by themselves and stuff and it got officialized later on uh, with the help of many people including myself we now since a, since a year or so we have the fifa lgbtqia plus network with uh, lesbian gay transgender queer intersexual asexual allies and plus um, being openly uh, working at fifa and uh, trying to change um, raising awareness eliminate misconceptions, etc. And of course, a family network, activity network, that's, that's like the bigger, um, the bigger networks, let's say, but there's also a lot of change when it comes to how do you want to be? How do you want to see FIFA as an employee? How do you want to be able to express yourself? How does it feel as a gay person traveling to a World Cup that is not in a very gay-friendly area, for example? Um, how do you prepare yourself? What help is there? And, and, and this network turns out to be already a very interesting part. Organizational structure, um, my div division I'm working in is the social responsibility and education division with three departments. One is about um, sustainability and the environment, starting from uh, waste managed, uh, ma management to tobacco-free tournaments, carbon, carbon offsetting, uh, and also uh, green stadiums, for example. In Qatar, just the last stadium uh, received a green stadium certificate, for example, because it's, it's the first stadium uh, that will be completely be refoldable and could be delivered to a different country uh, and reused somewhere else where it's probably more needed after the World Cup. Then we have the safeguarding and, and child protection department, um, Everything that you see here has also a historical background. For example, the Safeguarding and Child Protection Department was part of another department, more about member associations, where there, there were and there are still cases where people in power, men in power, abuse especially young women who are playing football, who are referees. There are more and more cases coming. 
and uh, this became a bigger issue. FIFA is also working on uh, where everybody, you even can sign up to become um, a safeguarding and child protection expert. Um, there's a course at, at an open university. Uh, I can share the link later on. Responsibility in general. We are talking about, let's say, the mavericks inside the organization. Uh, no one wants to hear that, and when my boss hears me that I'm saying that here, he, he will give me a hard time, but it is difficult. Like, we are change makers. We have, when, whenever we are in somebody else's door inside FIFA, everybody knows that could mean work. It has changed a little bit because people really see the value of the work that we do. We have, we didn't do the change all ourselves. We have allies and in every department and every department now understands that anti-discrimination cannot be our job. It has to be mainstreamed throughout the, throughout the organization. Like what can we do if legal is not following? What can we do if all the other departments are, are not following? That we are working with, which is when it comes to uh, regulations, it's legal and compliance, of course, for example. When it comes to education, it's a lot more. It's competitions, people who are organizing the competitions because we have to train 20,000 students in Qatar. We have to train 20,000 um, volunteers in Qatar with regards to diversity and anti-discrimination, how to behave in an intercultural team with intercultural fans coming from, from everywhere. And, um, we are also working, of course, with, with our former human uh, HR, which is now called People, Technology and Operations, with the FIFA Women's Network, with the FIFA Women's Division, of course, who is responsible for the women's tournaments, um, etc., etc. And FIFA, FIFA Museum and FIFA Foundation are separate entities, um, for example, just to point out a few of them and not, me, not mention all of them. Um, but people, I think, can read out the slides while I'm doing this, I realize that people are much more multifunctional these days than I was when I started to do this. Um, strategic approach. Everything that we do is based on the FIFA statutes. And uh, anti-discrimination appears in many different parts in the FIFA statutes. I will not read that out, but if you see um, the list of different forms of discrimination that, that, are, that are listed here, you can already tell there's a history behind that. That list was shorter when it started. It still means that topic is very new to organizations in general, not only in sports. And this, this list will grow longer in the next years. It will, it will probably be um, a different one. And then there is a good reason why it says any other statutes, for example, or discrimination based on any other reason to kind of already be prepared. I'm currently, for example, uh, when, it, when it comes to the next uh, review of this FIFA statutes, we are trying to work, for example, on here it says gender, but we want to work on, on sex characteristics, gender identity, identity and expression, to, uh, and sexual orientation, etc., etc. So to diversify the terminology that we have here. But at some point, of course, of course, the list gets so long. Um, that people can also get lost. So there's always a danger that all these different forms that need to be represented, that need to be shown, that need to be talked about also in a sustainable manner and worked upon, uh, that they get lost in this term discrimination. This is like an amal amalgam of, of so many different terms. So that's why it is important also to have this and then the current FIFA vision reflects that, of course. That's the vision of the FIFA president himself, um, where um, discrimination is in the center at FIFA at the moment. When, for example, the World Cups in Qatar and Russia were decided, no UN guiding principles, international guiding principles on business and human rights were existing. So FIFA, uh, FIFA is now being, being uh, uh, crit criticized to give the World Cup to now Qatar and before Russia, but when it was decided in 2010, there were not even any UN guiding principles with regards to companies working abroad and how, for example, they look at workers' welfare 
when they work in countries where salaries are lower, etc., etc. We have incorporated these UN guiding principles now and have changed our bidding requirements for future tournaments. So, for example, when it was for the World Cup in 2026, which will be in the US, Mexico and Canada, we received, I think it was only 120 pages that were officially also shown publicly on our homepage uh, on human rights. From, from, and, and the others also came up with, and that was Morocco with more than 70 pages, only on human rights. And that, that never has happened before. So there, are, there have to be certain commitments on, on the topic that we are talking today, and it's crucial for, for giving tournaments somewhere. Um, also, a, a part of the history, let's say. Operationally, um, we developed a five-pillar structure. Already mentioned the slide before, we have regulations, we have, which is the basis for everything, let's say, we have on one side education, and we have on the other side controls and sanctions. Unfortunately, I'm not the punishing kind of guy. Like I don't like that. I'm more the I'm coming from the educational side as a sociologist. But uh, we also realize that when, for example, member associations or individuals are being punished, they are coming to us more saying, "What can we do to do prevention?" We don't, like now it's maybe just a fine that we have to pay, but tomorrow it will be forfeiting matches, it will be losing points, and that could lose someone to participate at the World Cup. So people are coming to us, and it helps also, apart from the other parts that we have uh, here. Um, communications uh, don't only do work, uh, also talk about it and do campaigns, which many people always thought when I arrived at FIFA campaigns like having a certain tagline in a stadium that's anti-discrimination and to a certain extent yes of course you have to have visibility but if there's nothing behind that banner sustainably then you cannot work and that's why education controls and sanctions is so important and also the last pillar networking and cooperation when I came to FIFA we realized that football especially, not only FIFA, they are always trying to try to reinvent the wheel. They didn't really work together with non-governmental organizations, a little bit with intergovernmental organizations like the UN, UNESCO, etc. Um, but they always try to solve problems inside their own families. And that, there was need for a change. That's also what, what the task force back then said. And that's why networking and cooperation is cross-cutting with all the other elements that we have, but it's still worth to mention it because when there is a historical reason that football always does that by itself. So I already explained that a little bit. Um, I don't need to go into detail here. Um, I think I already did that, what it means, um, especially when we talk about education. It's, as I said, it's not only training staff at tournaments, or before tournaments, it's also uh, working with member associations. You will see a little bit more in a minute. Um, but what does it mean? Regulations, I already said, FIFA statutes, but it, it cascades down to many, many different regulations that we have. We have a human rights policy since, I think, 2017, which was built up together with the United Nations uh, advising FIFA in the very beginning with a report that led to a certain group and uh, to a certain to the uh, human rights policy to be developed and followed up upon with, with projects. Code of ethics, for example, is important. Code of conduct is important. Disciplinary code when it comes to potential sanctions on racism, homophobia, sexism as the three most important forms of discrimination in football at the moment. It's also in the laws of the game. The laws of the game are not only decided by FIFA, but also by uh, the four British member associations. So everybody has its word in the laws of the game because the laws of the game derive from, 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 from Great Britain. So that's why it's not only FIFA's decision to change these laws of the games. Sexual harassment policy at the workplace, that's of course for our employees, but we also have similar regulations when it comes to tournaments and also grievance mechanisms, complaint mechanisms uh, for our people working at the tournaments, especially on the ground that are not FIFA employees, 
that are just hired also fall, fall under the same kind of grievance mechanism. I will speak a little bit more in a minute. Kalizia already said, um, I'm responsible for the FIFA Good Practice Guide on Diversity and Anti-Discrimination. That's the main, let's say, uh, compendium that, that combines all different examples from all over the world that we found not, not being exhaustive, but also structurally giving member associations advice on how to um, develop their system with regards to anti-discrimination. Um, engagement strategy and advice for member associates, yes, that's one thing. Training for match officials, starting with referees, which I usually do by myself at FIFA tournaments. But then two workforce, which I already said can be down to 20,000 per sector, per functional area, which I cannot do by myself. So that works, train the trainers. So we are basically training then, for example, 200 trainers, who then will train uh, 20,000 people on the ground in the steward area, for example, or in food and beverage sales, etc. We also have the FIFA Foundation Community Program, where more than 100 projects worldwide are funded per year that are doing much more grassroots football development. Um, we also have Football for Schools, another project that was very dear to our president, where um, football spreads more into schools, get more into the, the schemes of schools let's say, than it was ever before, and the FIFA Forward program. That's the program where all member associations, all national football associations can apply for funding. And since Gianni Infantino is president, it is three times the amount than it was before that people can get. Of course, there's much more compliance also than before. For example, if you want to benefit from the big expansion on women's football funding, you have to comply with certain regulations, for example, having, having a competition in place for women that lasts for a certain time per year, etc., etc. Otherwise, you will not get the full amount that is dedicated, uh, and so on and so on. Mm. Oops, I went back, so I held my stick the wrong way. Uh, that's not good. Controls and sanctions. Um, the FIFA disciplinary code is very harsh. It starts with a fine, but it can be a match ban very quickly uh, for, for example, fans. Because all member associations, all national football associations, sign that they are liable for their fans. No matter where they are educated, it's in the stadium, there are safety mechanisms, security mechanisms in place that should work should be campaigns, there should be education carried out. So for example, if there is fans at FIFA competitions screaming racism, screaming homophobic chants, for example, there will be people who see that. I will explain that how that works in a minute. And uh, member associations will be sanctioned. That could lead to a fine, that could lead to a part-time closure of a stadium, it could lead to a full closure of a stadium. It could lead to, to losing points, points and forfeiting matches. Um, the referee has the, has the decision or can make the decision to stop the game because of racism, for example. If that doesn't help, to suspend the match, which means the players will go back to the dressing room for a reasonable amount of time with a crisis security meeting taking place when the match is halted discussing whether the match can be abandoned even, which would be the last step. We never needed the first step, but more and more we see, for example, in CONCACAF at the moment, that uh, the three-step procedure is being, uh, is making, they, they make use of it. So there is, we had, we had step two at CONCACAF tournaments, for example, with uh, Mexico, for example, where matches had to be stopped and it was close to be abandoned. So, um, this is something that is in place and referees have to be trained on that. It's based on law five of the games where the referee has the chance to stop the match at any time. And uh, I said that racism, any form of discrimination will be recognized in the stadium. How? We have the anti-discrimination monitoring system. That means we have observers, for example, in Qatar at every match, observers that understand the fan culture of team A 
and understand the fan culture of Team A. It's not an old white European guy who would uh, observe matches uh, that are not from Europe or with, with, uh, with a participating team from Europe. There would be other people doing that. And we, we scouted these people. We uh, trained these people together with the fair network. And there is an anti-discrimination match report. And this match report has the same value as a referee's report. This match report will be regarded by the disciplinary committee. And uh, I mean, that, that's, how, that's where, where sanctions can be based upon. Uh, there's also any other person. If you are at the FIFA competition, and if you can come up with evidence on racism, then we could also open cases. Or the FIFA disciplinary committee, which is an, an independent committee, can open cases. But evidence is important. That's why we have the specialists who create video evidence who work anonymously, sometimes under very uh, difficult conditions, because it's not always safe to be among certain kind of fans and try to make a video. Um, I already, I think, uh, killed one or two slides that come later on, but that's what I mean with... Uh, discrimination days every year at the biggest FIFA tournament uh, now finally happening in Qatar again uh, during the quarterfinals on 9 and 10th of December 10th of December being the International Human Rights Day which is a great coincidence usually uh, World Cups are in, in, in June July now we can have the anti-discrimination days together on, on that special day uh, we have the FIFA diversity award which was also halted during during COVID but we are working on a revamp and where we also kind of scout grassroots projects all over the world who get a certain price money and will be part of a certain portfolio and we work together with them. Then um, campaigns that we have for many, many different reasons. Domestic violence, which is the end violence campaign, uh, not only doing it by ourselves, but also linking up with UN, with the World Health Organization, depending on, on what we are talking about. Um, domestic violence was, was a re very recent one. Um, then, of course, the Say No to Racism campaign, which will become a, a new tagline for the World Cup in Qatar that will completely change. We also used uh, living diversity as a theme. Because FIFA came up with the idea of living football as a logo, and that kind of like turns out to like living X, Y, Z. So we also have living diversity to um, represent the topics that we have behind these banners that will be shown in matches. Anti-discrimination days means, for example, that for these quarterfinals at the World Cup, the match protocol will be changed, the pre-match protocol. There will be the players mixing up behind a certain banner, all the advertising boards will be changed, uh, there will be announcements, there will be clips on TV, the captains, the team captains will say something kind of mark these special days that we have at the biggest tournament each year. Just to give you one example, uh, and of course at the moment it's, it's very important to react to uh, protecting players and other team members, coaches, etc. Uh, with regards to social media abuse, we are now working on an in-tournament moderation service for online abuse where everybody um, playing at a FIFA tournament for the next year as a test phase and we have six to eight World Cups per year. Right? Many people only know the men's World Cup and the women's World Cup but there's also youth World Cups, beach soccer, futsal, etc. where players and all team members, delegates, accredited people can sign up to our in-tournament moderation service where which, which, which has an artificial intelligence that can detect social media abuse. We're always feeding, feeding the algorithm with certain keywords, but also knowing that certain keywords in one culture can mean something else somewhere else. If many, many people, for example, chant against Argentinian teams and against Argentinian fans, the, 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 uh, the, the Spanish word, uh, term gato, which just means cats, and there are other fan groups all over the world that call themselves gatos. They lost something, but 
when it comes to Argentina, there's a certain background why this is derogatory. And I could explain you a lot more about this. So we have to be aware that it's not only about feeding an AI with algorithms and keywords, but also understanding that certain terms in certain countries could mean something completely different. Like when we are training, for example, also our workforce on the ground for Qatar, we are also training them on, on, on hands and gestures and on, on, that can mean something completely else. Like something positive here can mean something completely negative in a different part of, of, of the world. And that's important, especially when you sell food. And there's, you cannot communicate in one language. People tend to use hand signs to be friendly, but sometimes it can get you into, into troubled waters because you don't use the hand sign that the person that, that is the percept, uh, percept, uh, percepting, uh, on the percepting end uh, understands. Networking and cooperation, we do a stakeholder engagement constantly, not only related to tournaments, but at the moment it's, it's a lot. We have a, a, a core group on uh, inclusion and anti-discrimination for Qatar, where different intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organizations are sitting at the table starting to discuss workers' welfare, women's rights, uh, freedom of speech, LGBTQI plus rights. We have a special group also dedicated, 16 international groups on LGBTQI plus groups and Qatar. Um, we are also working, for example, with indigenous groups when it comes to the Women's World Cup next year in Australia and New Zealand about how could we use the World Cup to lift up topics in this area where the World Cup takes part. How can we f feed that with projects? How can we link up that with existing projects? Because it's not FIFA coming somewhere and, and reinventing the wheel, but picking up on, on good practice that is out there. Or trying to link them with people who are already working on these topics in other parts of the world. And maybe they can link up, maybe they can learn from each other or benefit from each other. Even if some parts don't work out in one country and works out in another one, you can still kind of distance yourself and learn and, and kind of verify your own approach even if, if um, you cannot benefit from someone's country. My colleague does accessibility, which is a very important topic. I just want to cross cut a little bit on this one. Uh, one billion people or 15% of the world's population experience some sort of, 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 of disability. So when we talk about disabled people, people with limited mobility, etc. It's, it's a huge group and we want to include everyone. Football is for all, not only in the stadium but also on the pitch and it's important that FIFA stadiums at FIFA competitions are accessible not only to people with wheelchairs but also people who need audio commentary for example. Um, this is uh, some examples of, of what we do. Uh, and this is how accessibility looks at FIFA tournaments at the moment. So safe, inclusive, and barrier-free. It's related very much to the infrastructure. We are now working more and more to accessible toilet facilities. That means to people who are disabled. But we are also looking further now and trying to introduce gender-neutral bathrooms and, uh, to our tournaments, which is not only related to people who are transgender, for example, non-binary or gender-fluid, or whoever someone identifies, but it's also looking at, at, at a different community. Um, we are, when we are talking about gender neutral toilets, we are talking about parents who have a young kid that is of a different gender and don't know which toilet to use. There's elder people with a caretaker that people can bring to free tournaments uh, if, with a certain certificate for free that has a different gender. How would you use certain toilets? Uh, there's also um, Power raises. I don't know if you ever heard about this. This is the biggest phobia in the world, where which means that people cannot relieve themselves when so many people are around. I'm suffering from that myself. I just cannot pee when I'm standing right next to another man. I can't. I can't. It doesn't work. Or it takes a lot of time. And uh, that's also where gender-neutral toilets with certain, with a with different cabin situation can help. So it's not only about uh, uh, certain minorities, it's also about other minority groups that are in there and sometimes even majority groups. Another example, of course, is, is co uh, color blindness or people with uh, partially sight. Um, here you can see a good example from UEFA 
on, on how people who are colorblind see the match. And it's not really easy to understand then who is who when the teams are playing. So we are looking much more into stadium guidelines to change the equipment regulations to also take care of equipments on when teams come up with their or decide on their own equipment. Because the people who are partially sighted, who are colorblind, see the match with different eyes and, and, and sometimes have, have big difficulties, right? And that's a big group. It's a big group. There are many people in the world who cannot distinguish blue from green naturally because for them it's, it's the same thing. Uh, 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 for others, it's the opposite. What looks green to me is many different kinds of green uh, to, to somebody in a different part of the world. But how does it work uh, when we look at competitions in general apart from accessibility, which is my core part um, that we are talking about? We have a sustainability strategy for the tournament in Qatar, for example, but also for other tournaments. I do the example Qatar because it's right in front of us uh, and, and also when it's the men's tournament, this is the tournament that pays all FIFA activities for four years. The women's tournament is breaking even. Even when we talk about FIFA e-competitions, they are breaking even more and more. But the FIFA men's tournament is the tournament which kind of finances everything that FIFA does for the next four years. There's not much more income, right? So everything else is, is investment, is development, is, is trying to make football accessible. When we're talking about the women's tournament that just happened in Costa Rica, which is the under-20s tournament, World Cup, or the World Cup that is coming up in India in a few weeks uh, for the under-17 women, that, 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 is a different, that is a different discussion, right? We have to finance this. We have to invest in this to develop football. And therefore, the Men's World Cup has, doesn't only bring in the, the, the most budget, but it's also our flagship competition. We have to invest in this tournament. So I can do most of the projects, sorry, I can do most of the projects at a men's tournament because there's the most money also for social responsibility. Because this, this, this tournament brings in the most money. So I can also, I have also more to work with and then the women's tournament. But at other tournaments, we have to sometimes improvise and have to work with what we find also on the ground. So um, you can see here the human rights pillar, which is more about workers' welfare, for example, um, and uh, the social pillar, which is the pillar that, that I'm most related to. But five pillars are the, uh, are the important ones. When we talk about economics, why do we talk about economics and discrimination? That is also very important for us, that how, how do we sustainably build up an economy related to a tournament? How do we buy things? Supply chains, for example. We're looking much more into the structural, the structure behind and not only on, on the racist chance, for example, on the pitch. Um, so when we, when we make the sustainability strategy, we just don't sit in, in the FIFA headquarters and make them ourselves. We consulted here, for example, with 130 plus stakeholders during the process, writing down the structure and approving the structure. Um, which contains 80 concrete initiatives and everything is based not only on FIFA statutes but also on related um, UN sustainability development goals, the UN guiding principles for um, international business and human rights, as I said. Mm. Another uh, clip of, uh, out of this sustainability strategy, which kind of reflects the area that I work in much more. It has a lot about accessibility, culture, understanding, inclusivity, and uh, freedom of speech, let's say, which then relates concretely into projects. And, and I don't want to stay so much with that area. It's very, it's very uh, well documented and can be read out everywhere. I want to dig deeper. So um, I will also not go so much into detail here because this is my daily work and, and that's the best I can talk about when it comes, for example, to the concrete measures. I'm the guy on the ground. I'm, I'm, I'm trying also to train as many people as possible myself because if someone trains someone who trains someone who then trains someone who in the end trains 20,000 people, you can imagine how things change from chain part to chain part. 
So um, that's, some, that's something that I do. I will be going in and out of Qatar, I already do all the time to train people, to prepare people. Um, we'll be doing that on the ground uh, before the match with FIFA match officials, with the referees, for example. They need to know how to apply the three-step procedure, what to do. Of course, they can do it by themselves, right? out that it doesn't happen again and make clear with the with the player that this is what we could do at the time there are different dynamics during a match that the referee can oversee the best so there's also different opportunities or different options for the referee let's say um, the anti-discrimination monitoring system I already explained the observers how they work anonymously often or mostly or all the time let's say all the time they are anonymous from the country, from team A, from team B, from neutral organization, they have to sign a code of neutra neutrality because if uh, a Brazilian uh, expert is watching a Brazilian match, you would say, well, how would this guy go against his own team? But there are experts working at universities that we are trying to scout from different countries, from different areas in the world who know the specificities of the fan culture, people working in non-governmental organizations, ex-fans who are now social workers, for example, who work with football fans in certain countries, etc., etc. And there are also people that have a German passport but don't really identify as German, who can also go against their own team. And I was, I was, an, I was an observer myself for UEFA before, and whenever Germany faced another sanction, the German member association called me and said, was it you again? Was it you again being somewhere and now denouncing us, saying something? I said, no, I wasn't even there this time. It wasn't me. But that's what you get, right? And that's why people have to work anonymously because it can cost their jobs they have in their country when they are working in that area when someone doesn't want you. That didn't happen with the German Member Association. But of course they wanted to know what's going on, like why and what. You didn't hear anything. Why did you? Um, and yeah, there's always in different countries, especially where there is a rise of, of far-right parties gaining more votes. 
trying to uh, make observers the scapegoats, trying to, uh, to blame the people who are reporting and, and not causing the problem. Uh, that can happen, unfortunately. Mm. We engage with NGOs, as I already said, as using the example for Qatar, intergovernmental organizations, but also fan groups. In Europe, there is the Football Supporters uh, Europe. There's also an, an, an alliance in, in uh, North America. But it's not easy to find other, let's say, international fan alliances. In, in Brazil, for example, it's not easy to bring Corinthians Sao Paulo to the table with other fans of other clubs in, in Brazil. In, in Europe, that works a little bit. Uh, in, in North America, that works. And, and we are also trying to, to look and, and, and help and, and support and, and learn also from, from other confederations to kind of create these kind of links in other countries as well. We have a human grievance right, uh, human grievance, uh, human rights grievance mechanism at uh, FIFA competitions now, where complaints can be made. I will explain a little bit later how. It's not only against FIFA as a tournament organizer, it can be anything related to a tournament. Something that happens to someone who has a ticket traveling to a World Cup at the airport, for example. Of course, we cannot do something directly, but we have the leverage to reach out to the organization. So this human rights grievance mechanism is linked to companies directly or indirectly related to the World Cup, to governmental organization uh, structures in the, in the country of the tournament where we will follow up with human rights uh, grievances and try to find a remedy for emergency things in about 48 hours. Other other complaints can take later. We also, for the first time now in Qatar, we will have human rights volunteers. We have about 96 human rights volunteers and I think 10 more international leaders who will try, try to, to make a survey about the direct fan experience of fans with regards to human rights, traveling to a different country. We don't do this because the World Cup is in Qatar. We do this because Diversity and anti-discrimination at tournaments is always evolving. It happened in Russia as well. Like, why are you doing the three-step procedure for the first time in Russia? Is it because we have far-right hooligans? We said, well, uh, it probably helps, but it's, that's not the reason. It's, the reason is that we want to be more sustainable when we make our tournaments safe for players and for fans and for everybody working there. Um, so when it comes to training, what do we do? for example. Two, two, uh, two uh, target groups um, as an example. When we train the referees, as, as I already said, uh, or the players, they need to know how to address discrimination at the pitch, um, how to react to discrimination. Of course, we cannot tell a player how to react. Racism is, is a very emotional thing that happens and everybody reacts a little different. And it is up to the player in the end to decide what to do. But we have players who already reacted in the past who can speak to other players and say, look, that's what I did, and I think it's still right, or today I would react differently. Or there are new measures in place that you don't even know about. So we are not only train, train, training referees, but also there will be um, training and, and information for players out there for member associations, for national football associations, on how to prepare before a tournament. And also example number two is more for, for the staff on the ground. And when we talk about the staff on the ground in Qatar, we talk about the staff already being very international. As I said, the Qataris in their country are in a minority. There's much, much more migrant workers, and therefore also the people working at our tournament will be from all over the world. So there's already, I can already feel microaggressions out there in the team with people working together, coming from different countries, Etc. Etc. So how do we build a creative team? That's something that we do. How do we uh, um, train or raise awareness on cross-cultural communication within the team, but also with the fans then in the end? Because they are also coming from everywhere, Dif bringing different languages, bringing different perceptions. So how do you kind of, how can we sensitize people to put themselves into other people's shoes? Kind of like go over the edge a little bit and then change perspectives try to understand, or not understand, but at least, uh, yeah, get a little glimpse of what other people feel. And everybody working in a team, everybody coming to a tournament sees it a little bit different, maybe, because they're coming from a different area, different background, whatever. 
we, so we train them more and more also about unconscious bias and microaggressions, which is not always easy because these topics came up in the US more and more and, and, and then through Britain to Europe. But when we talk about microaggressions in the Arab world, we have to talk about different things, right? There are things like, ah, you're Moroccan, you're not really Arab. There, there, are, there are things where we, have to, I, where we have to change the examples that we use in trainings. When we are in a different country, different examples. That makes it um, always interesting for me and my team and the colleagues on the ground, but it's also tricky. And it's, we are not always hitting the point yet. We are also still searching for experts. So if the experts here want to help us with this, also as anti-discrimination match observers, please contact me. Um, then also, um, permitted statements in favor of human rights. We have to take care that people who are just performing their human right get their banner into the stadium, for example. And there's a fine line between what is political, what is offensive, and what is, yeah, what is discrimination in one country and in one country. It is not, it's, it's very, we have these, these experts who know this. We have people in the video control room, let's say, the venue operating center in the stadium, who see every banner that comes into the stadium screened at the gates and make thumbs up or thumbs down within three minutes, some, mostly under one minute. And I'm one of the guys in, because I'm, I'm a flag nerd. In, when, when I, so I'm one of these guys uh, in, in, in this venue control center where we clearly say, like, this is just something that is in line with the FIFA Human Rights Article 3 in our FIFA statutes. This is just somebody speaking about anti-discrimination. But if someone, for example, says, well, we want, to, we want to change that person in the government or we want to change that law, then it becomes politics. But if it's a general statement on human rights and anti-discrimination, it will be allowed. And this fine line is, is a little bit flexible, but we have a good experience at the moment. It will, of course, change because conflicts geopolitical conflicts change and that will create new uh, reactions that we have to learn about but uh, uh, that's also different in every region and depending on who is playing in which tournament of course um, dealing with uh, discrimination in line with safety and security procedures I myself was working on more than 60 different procedures and trying to mainstream diversity and anti-discrimination in all its procedures starting with safety and security at the gates, as I'm saying, but also talking about uniform policy. FIFA uniform, work uniform. For people on the ground, for people like me, um, that has changed. You cannot copy the uniform policy as it has been done before. People with diabetes, for example, should not wear high heels. Did we know that? There's a certain way why they don't. Uh, there's, there, there were certain makeup and shaving policies and old uniform uh, uh, policies uh, uh, that, that, had, that have to be <laughs> eradicated, right, or changed. So there's always a constant work on procedures that will then lead to a different action on the ground. How do we control people at the gates? How are people identified as men or women or as them, for example? How do we do? When someone comes to a FIFA tournament, they bring a ticket, and at some tournaments there's a FIFA fan ID which replaces the visa, makes it easier. When you have a ticket, you apply for the fan ID, you can go to the country, which you probably sometimes cannot do that without the World Cup going there. But none of these documents, neither the ticket or the fan ID, says anything about gender. People are not required to bring their passport. The fan ID replaces the passport. So it's about training people in different countries that if someone says, I'm a man or I'm a woman or I'm none of these things that people accept that and that is depending on which country we are in a more or less difficult adventure that we are on and you have to address that, address that in different ways another example the human rights grievance mechanism uh, that's the QR code that leads you directly to it and also the link um, everybody who who suffers or affect or is affected within their dignity and does not feel right about something can complain. Not only fans who travel there, anybody. And that human rights grievance mechanism will stand also 
after that tournament and, and goes beyond tournaments will be uh, used at other tournaments as well. So uh, you can report anonymously. There's a website or a call-in. There is a creation of a mailbox for secure communication where your name will not be revealed if you don't want it to be revealed. You can upload evidence. You can name witnesses if there are some and want to be mentioned, etc. And there is a very complex process behind it. Of course, remedies can be just an apology. We had situations where the racism, and then we bring them together with the person who caused it. In this case, for example, that I'm talking about, it was a security gate operator, and then we bring together security, this gate operator, together with the camera team. We look at the footage, what happened at the gate, when the camera team said they faced it, and we try to verify, we try to discuss, and we find, try to find a certain consensus, and at least learnings for the next tournament, as an example. Um, but the human right, rights grievance mechanism is uh, not only working during the tournament, many things cannot be solved during the tournament, right? Of course, if there is someone in jail, because he or she or they exercise their human right, and in one country a person ends up in jail, then FIFA has to intervent or, uh, intervene or try to intervene quite quickly. Sometimes indirectly, behind the scenes, but always having direction to the organizations in charge of the country. That's part of, 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 of the basics. Mm. The procedure for discrimina uh, discriminatory incidents is much more than, than just the monitoring system and the three-step procedure that I mentioned before. I already said regular safety and security measures come first. That can be monitoring of a situation, that can be a warning, that can be confiscation of items or removing people from the stadium. That's regular security measures that should be in place at every, not only at the FIFA competition, but everywhere. But then also we have the people working in the venue operation center, the VOC, the video control room, let's say, the human rights and anti-discrimination assessors who also identify banners, help with situation, identify the tools, any item that uh, comes into uh, the stadium, also help with identifying chance, for example. Then I already mentioned the anti-discrimination match observers. Not more to say. We have before every match at the FIFA uh, competition, we have a proactive anti-discrimination stadium announcement being made, which sometimes drowns a little bit in the whole communication flow. There are so many videos out there. So that's why it's just a supporting measure that sometimes is more listened to when published on, on FIFA.com or elsewhere on social media but it's there. Uh, we also have a reactive stadium announcement. If, for example, regular security measures don't work out, the human rights assessor was sleeping in the video control room, which would be me, um, or uh, something else goes wrong, there is a reactive stadium announcement that doesn't interfere with the match. The match will not be stopped. It's like, let's say, another measure number zero, let's say. Uh, where uh, this can support a security measure, but all, if all of this doesn't work, regular security measures, reactive stadium announcement, then of course the referee would be addressed or notified of something and it could stop the match. Um, suspend the match, abandon the match. That's basically uh, the procedure at FIFA competitions and we advise all other member associations and also confederations, who are not FIFA members by the way, to adopt the system. Um, good practice for member associations. Now we are going away from the tournaments. I'm looking a bit at the time because uh, I cannot find my phone right now. But um, where are we now? 10, 20 past 3. That's not too bad. OK, international good practice for member associations. What are the pressing issues at the discrimination in football at the moment? We are talking about players and uh, players um, and fans also, <laughs> and other uh, people, uh, team members facing racist abuse on and off the pitch, from fans or abuse of other fans, other players who abuse other players, which is more difficult because then it's like somebody saying something one on one, right? It's not easy to prove, and also um, abuse that match officials face themselves, like referees. 
racism is one of the main things, but at the moment the main thing, for example, on social media is homophobia, quite clearly. So sexism, homophobia, racism, the, th the, th the big three, and the infamous big three, let's say, at the moment and then for quite some time now, in football, on and off the pitch. When I talk off the pitch, I'm talking about online abuse on social media. But then also, of course, we are looking at women and minorities facing discrimination and barriers. Not only playing football, but also getting access to institutions. What do you do if you're not a player and you want to get into the business of sports, especially football here? What do you do after you stopped your career as a player or as a referee? What are the barriers? How can we be become a better organization as FIFA ourselves with our recruitment policy? How do we recruit people? Can we recruit the right way? Do we recruit the right way? And how do, can we lead by example to also help our member associations? Not help, sometimes learn from them even. Because some, there are member associations who have, because of their legislation, a better approach than FIFA has based in Switzerland. So um, these are the pressing issues. And when we talk about inter uh, international good, pra uh, good practice and how we react to this, we talk about uh, nothing that it happens somewhere uniquely. Because there's no country, club, or member association, association that is Im immune to societal impact of discrimination. Discrimination can occur at any club or member association. What matters is how you acknowledge it, work, uh, work to prevent and address incidents when they happen. You have to identify and name the elephant in the room. Name the issue. That's the first step. If you deny that something is homophobia, because everybody says it's, it's just a swear word, another swear word, then we will get nowhere. So we always have to sometimes work with people who, who don't want to see things as what they are, with linguistical experts, with historical experts, with independent experts in general, to kind of prove that it is and kind of work with them. It's, it's a journey. Sensi sensitization, raising awareness is a journey. Mm. So, and then also engage with fans and the wider community. Wider community can also be the migrant community in your, in your area, in your, in your local, in your region, in your area, wherever, uh, we, whatever we are talking about, if you are a club or a member association. Um, engage with fans. Try to make them a part of the game. Sometimes people in certain functions in a member association change a lot, but the fans stay. And sometimes fans should not only be seen as risk factors, but also as, as experts when it comes to safety and security, because they are using the stadiums for ages, maybe even longer than uh, the young new safety and security officer who uh, has maybe a five years experience. Um, so it's not only seeing fans as a problem, but also trying to participate with them or let them participate in the solution, being part of the solution, becoming a part of the solution. Um, and then, of course, act and communicate when incidents happen. Sometimes it is action and reaction still. Sometimes member associations come to us and ask us for support when things happen. We try to change that, but often it is when a member association gets sanctioned, is in danger to be sanctioned, or when certain single incidents happen locally when people come. What we do is uh, we don't only um, give them what we know, we also try to find other member associations who are working to something related and link them up. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Mm. Strategy and prevention plan, that's what we roll out for every member association that wants to do more on diversity and anti-discrimination. That's the strategic approach in an ideal scenario. And we all know when it comes to diversity and anti-discrimination, many national football associations don't have available or do not make available the money that would be needed to implement this. So this is just a blank f portfolio from Zurich, which doesn't work everywhere else. But that's how we start. And then we see what is already there in a certain country where we can build on and how we can enforce certain things. Sometimes it's just 
dedicating money that people already get from FIFA to this topic in a certain area, be it the development of women's football uh, or other things. I, I, I kind of ignored all my videos for some reason, because that's also another part of being carried away. Um, I maybe, hopefully, will be showing one very soon. Um, so, we cannot always say, hire someone, hire an expert on anti-discrimination. There might not even be experts professionally in anti-discrimination in certain countries. Um, there might not be the money, so we say, appoint someone that we can work with, that you can work with in a, in a constant manner, trying to create consistency. Are there financial resources that you already have that you can just try to relocate? How can there be financial resources that can be used? Sometimes there is a governmental agency that could help. Um, we create, we try to help them create interdepartmental working groups within their own member associations. Because as I said before, it's not only the anti-discrimination expert in an organization trying to bring change. It's a network of people in many different departments. I cannot do anything with, our, with my colleagues in safety and security. I cannot do anything with our colleagues in marketing when I want to do a communications campaign. Uh, it's about branding, right? Uh, uh, I have to work with our communication guys. I have to work with our competition guys. I have to work with refereeing if I want to train the referees. And I have to make sure that the legal review of all the different regulations are streamlined with regards to discrimination. So we need an interdepartmental working group as a start in member associations if we want to start doing more. And as I said, don't reinvent the wheel, engage people from outside the organization. That's what we say. Um, do an analysis of where you are at the moment. What is the, what is the most burning issue or issues that you want to address? Do you have a mission statement on diversity and anti-discrimination in place? A little thing, but sometimes important. How do you see yourself as an organization? How do you recruit people? How, how do employees feel in your own organizations? Are you kind of embodying the same thing you want to see from fans? Um, also, do you have a diversity and anti-discrimination policy in place? Do you have a human rights policy maybe even in place? Do you have a strategy that follows up on that policy? Do we have an implementation plan that follows up on that strategy that is built on the policy? Very structured thinking that is sometimes very difficult, but we, you, you can be very surprised what we find in place already in many, many countries that, can, that don't even need that structure because they work, and that's fine as well. Um, what are the priorities of an action plan? With, and when you look inside the member associations, but also in, in domestic and international competitions, different perspectives, right? different, different solutions, no matter what, uh, uh, depending on what competitions you, uh, you look at. So regulations, when you look deeper, what do we tell member associations to do? I mean, we don't tell them what to do. We advise them, we recommend them. That's also something that we learn from many member associations. We don't come up with the solutions. We don't know them all. We don't know all the solutions out there. They're always changing. But mission statement, I say, um, spell out your commitment. Acknowledge the elephant in the room, let's say. Try to cover all forms of discrimination explicitly, intersectionally also. Embedding anti-discrimination into match day operations not only have an, a communication campaign that shows a nice banner, which can be very important to underline what you do. But if there's nothing to underline, you probably, like, a banner wouldn't help. Um, recruitment policy, as I already said, how can we hire people in a more diverse way? Like, how do we ensure that, for example, ethnic minorities are not all already declined when their names are seen on a paper when they try to apply, for example, at FIFA? Like, are, we, are we in the future, for example, working on a certain coding system where names will be coded, that people at least get to the next round? Are people, uh, there, there are recruitment ideas where people are interviewed behind a curtain, where you don't see the person, where you don't even hear the, the correct voice of the person. And still, there is bias. 
there is an experiment I don't know where exactly where people hired less female although there was a curtain and you couldn't really identify the person why because they heard the clicking of high heels behind the curtain so they just changed they just put a carpet underneath and the rate of people who got employed changed so there is there's many different ways out there in the world how to make yourself a better organization and we are constantly learning we don't have this all in place at FIFA ourselves but we are working on it to become better um, appointing people allocating resources as I already said also operational procedures controls and sanctions how, do, how, how does that relate to safety and security regulations, what you have in your policies? What do you do really? How do you train people on what you have in place? Do you have the free step protocol in place for referees that I mentioned? In, in Mexico or CONCACAF, it's only a two-step protocol because it works for them, but it follows the same idea. Um, working with uh, law enforcement um, to identify perpetrators could be another option in certain countries. There are certain data of hooligans, for example, in certain countries where um, people who made repeating infringements are registered. Is that something for your country or is that not? Or does that generalize people and how do people get out of this list if they, if they change? It's, it, you have to take care of, of, of how you control this data, of course. Um, yeah, how do you report discrimination in the stadium? Not every member association can afford an anti-discrimination monitoring system with observers at their domestic competitions, but there are probably measures where people can at least have a certain hotline or whatever is, is possible in, in, in any country. We, we advise people to use the Global Guide to Discriminatory Practices in Football by our partner, the FAIR Network. That's a guide, you can see the picture here in existing at the moment in, in five languages and will be updated for the World Cup in Qatar with more than 350 and still non-exhaustive discriminatory chants, banners from all over the world using, used by different fans that helps people to identify certain things. And also raise awareness among fans because sometimes fans are not aware what they are chanting. But we don't, as FIFA, it, we don't care if something is intentional or unintentional by someone. If it's discrimination, it still will be followed up upon. Because there will be people who feel offended, who feel harmed, who feel pain because of that. Although it was unintentional. Not always a fine or banning someone is the solution. It can also be education that could be a fine. Right? Uh, some member associations already introduced that. Training for people. Um, certain social services uh, that fans can do if uh, things happen. Because uh, it's maybe also different if, you, if, if it's a 14-year-old fan screaming something. And if it's a 40-year-old fan, like a person that is still in the making, let's say, becoming an adult, um, reflecting differently on things, Maybe there is a chance to, 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 to bring change to this person or this person incorporate change easier than to a 40-year-old person who already has certain manners maybe uh, cemented in a certain way. Um, in Europe, we always say that uh, someone that is, that is older than 27, you cannot change anymore. It, it, always get, it only gets worse. Uh, and studies prove that, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm becoming 50 this year. And I have, a, I have a contact group in my friendship that, that uh, c controls my, me becoming worse every year, I hope. Um, that's, I think, everything that we all should do in certain ways. Um, yeah. A protocol for stewards on how, how they work, how they identify things in the stadium, how they react to, to fans in the stadium, what do they do if fans come up with, with certain complaints. Etc. Do they just ignore them, or how can stewards to need to know need need to know what to do? Uh, education. What can national associations do? Training, training, training for different all different functional areas. I don't need to repeat myself here. Um, already mentioned this for FIFA um, for FIFA competitions. It's the same for member associations. 
who can be trained and what they can be trained. But there's other things that come into place that we, for example, have in the FIFA Museum, that we have in certain video sessions where you can celebrate your own history. Um, I just remember when I came here, the first black player, black German international player in the German national team who said, um, my other teammates, they could, when they wore their jeans as private person, they could still wear their suit when they were going to, to present themselves. But I was black all the time and couldn't change that. And, and I think this is something where, where you find these local heroes that you have that went through a certain time and still made it to the national team. Try to identify these people. Try to understand your, your ethnic minorities and try to highlight them, bring them into the picture. Um, you can also, like there are, in, there are countries that use that as lecture plans in schools now, where they use a player, for example, there's Arthur Friedenreich, a very German name, but a guy uh, descending from a, a black slave, a slave mother in Brazil being nearly as successful as Pelé. But it happened way before TV. It happened way before Pelé. No one knew this guy. This guy had to use um, rice, rice uh, uh, to, to, to paint his face white to be able to play in white teams and not to be also chanted against in a discriminatory way by fans. This has been changing in Brazil. There is now a lot of recognition, recognition for Friedenreich. And I think there are many countries who have their own Arthur Friedenreich. And, and, and the structures that made Arthur Friedenreich possible and how uh, and Arthur Friedenreich in some country changed a certain structure. And this is also something that can be much more done on a local level, better than, than FIFA can do it on an international level. School activities, also that FIFA can only, can only enforce a little bit with, with their Football for Schools program. But that's something that should be worked on also on a national level. Educational projects, how can, for example, um, social workers work in schools and use football as a tool to highlight certain, a certain way of understanding of rules in a, in a society. Football has clear rules, but also has its interpretations. And in some countries it helps when, FIFA, FIFA, uh, when people play football. It also helps self-confidence. Um, moving the goalpost is a project from, uh, with female players in Kenya from a certain area in, uh, in Nairobi. And since they started to use football in building up confidence of women in Kenya through that project, there's a certain saying in, Ni in Nairobi when a woman walks through the area in, in, their, in their quarter, they say, that's a moving with the goalpost girl. You can see how, how she walks how she responds. It's a different way. And that is through football. There, there are many, many ways of, on a local level, how you identify what is the most burning issue, where you can help more easier, where you have to find different approaches and what you can do. Networking and cooperation. Also, I said it all. Work with, work, with, work with the experts in your country. That's what we tell member associations, national football associations. Uh, work with authorities and law enforcement, of course. Um, involve your fan groups. Have inter internal and ex uh, external working groups. Organize conferences if you have the money to highlight what you're doing and try to develop uh, and have publications to document this. And also evaluation of the projects that you do which is the most difficult in, in, in many, many countries, and also not only in, in different countries, but also internationally. How do you address culturally embedded things? Things that are not maybe done by a far-right English or German group in a stadium. How do you address discrimination that is culturally embedded in a certain country, and people don't even see it as racism anymore? or as homophobia anymore. They just chant it and think it's another fan chant. It's just supporting my team or, or being mean to the other team, but not discrimination. How do we bring that into light? Mexico is a good case study here, because Mexico was the country who was very, very often fined uh, during FIFA competitions because of homophobia. And uh, there has been a great journey that, that Mexico did so far. They, they developed many, many measures 
that they identified worked for them the best and you can see change not only organizational change but also in the re response of fans um, there's homophobic chanting often when a goalkeeper takes a free kick the so-called P chant as we say um, P standing for a word that I'm not saying here but um, the goalkeeper doesn't even need to be identifying as gay, lesbian, or whatever. It's just used to, to diminish someone, to, to, kind of derog to be derogatory against someone, discrimin discriminatory against someone. That's mainly the thing, but also other chants that kind of use the idea of not being heterosexual to kind of speak out against someone. Um, there were these FIFA sanctions that led to uh, Femex Food, uh, the Mexican association, tr starting to work and starting also to uh, work in a pilot project with FIFA, where we see their progress review on, on a free base. Of course, that's what they do. They want to do that, and they do it uh, greatly at the moment, offering and promoting alternative chants, for example, to that chant trying to promote these chants, sometimes even just trying to use speakers to, to be louder than this chant. Um, for example, um, there's uh, positive incentives for fans. Tigres, a club in Mexico, for example, this football club is uh, refurbishing primary schools if uh, fans eradicate or manage to eradicate the chant. Sometimes if such a chant comes up that is homophobic, fans just need to realize that they can chant something positive for their club or for their team that will be louder and make the other people join in and forget about their discriminatory chants. It's the easiest way, but you have to work with your fans to, to kind of create that base. Uh, also, communication campaign, um, I said already, um, in and outside the stadium, on social media, very crucial here. Can react, you can react very quickly. It's not only the, 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 the say no to racism banner that I quoted here many, many times. There is social media. You can react every day to something that happens, of course, based on, on certain law assessments that you, that you currently do. When there is an incident, there are certain limitations. Mexico introduced five-year bans for fans that are, are identified with this chance. They remove these people from the stadium when they identify them. In Mexico, it is possible to identify these people quite quickly. They are now working with LGBTQI plus groups that they didn't do before to kind of make sure that they are represented within the solution, but also maybe getting visible in stadiums and feel safe about it. And they are cooperating with, with clubs in the US because, of course, there is a, a lot of uh, a big Mexican community in the US whenever Mexico plays in the US, but also Mexican, uh, people of Mexican descent supporting US clubs that then would support Mexico at the World Cup and travel to Qatar. So they understand it's not only fans living in Mexico supporting Mexico, but also fans from, from elsewhere. And they work with them. They have an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with the English Football Association. They work very closely and try to exchange good practice. So that's something where where there is change at the moment. Another example is the Brazilian Football Association with the fir first black member of the Football Association president at the moment with a lot of changes and a sustainable action plan. My colleague just came back from Rio presenting there and, and, and seeing great progress there with a great will to implement sustainable change. It's not only the, the same suspects in Europe like England who have the Premier League, who have the money, who can do something, but it's also in many, many countries we learn from examples that don't exist in Europe and that can even help in Europe to change things, of course. Mm. Communication, that's about visibility of what you're doing. Uh, don't only do things and hide things, but speak about it. The most difficult thing. Many things I, I was introducing today are not known by anybody that FIFA does because it's easier to get the racist chant into the media than the solution. It's not easy to talk about the good things happening. It's not only for FIFA, it's for anyone who tries to, to bring into the, line, into the spotlight the good things that happen. Right? When something good happens at the match, no one would report on it. 
uh, but when something happens that uh, that is negative it, it's it's more likely to be picked up speak to many journalists unfortunately I'm not like they know that, that they can sell this better and it's not the journalist that is the problem but the system and of course there, there, there have to be strategies to be found and people are working on it but it's still still a big problem to do so but but that's something that also member associations have to challenge uh, on their own level. Mm. Using players as role models, for example, is one thing. Not only doing press releases, interviews. Here, uh, through conferences, to take the responsibility, offer solidarity to players who can say, well, we cannot sanction because there is no evidence, but whenever there is discrimination, we, we believe you and we, we don't want this to happen again and even if we cannot follow up on a legal way we can follow up educationally in a certain way mm. because even if, if something cannot be proven you can still prevent you can still work on certain certain topics and in most of the cases player don't make up anything why would they um, there is uh, Borussia uh, Dortmund and I worked in, in conflict mediation with that club in Germany, for example, that does a lot, has a, has a, has a sustainable strategy in place with, with a lot of staff. They can afford that. One thing I wanted to point out is uh, football and beer, which is not in all countries the case. Uh, did is they launched a campaign in 2015 distributing beer quotas with a message saying no beer for racists and many um, many many bars and clubs were were ordering these these uh, uh, beer quotas and were also using this as a slogan for for example um, if you are a Borussia Dortmund fan if you are racist you, you are not welcome here so um, just to raise awareness but it also created a big debate and this is not just a PR campaign this is based on on, on, on a, on a, on a long-lasting campaign that, that um, Borussia Dortmund is doing and that also their players, as you can see, are engaging in their own way, where they, based on their right of, for human rights, try to express themselves more and more these days, luckily. Um, that's uh, uh, part of a complex strategy. There are many other examples all throughout the world, uh, world where fans do something, where players do something, uh, where clubs and, and, and fans do something together because if you see this uh, choreography of fans in Brazil that says so stop racism this has to be done in line with the, fan, uh, with the club of course uh, it's not really easy to bring all this material into the stadium to organize yourself in, in many countries fans can do that themselves but in many countries they need permission and also giving people the visibility, as you see here, the LGBTQI plus groups. I think that is also in Mexico, if I'm not wrong. No, it's in Brazil, where people get the time before the match, for example, on the pitch to say something. And there are many, many different ways in many different countries to highlight that. And that's uh, basically it. I killed all my videos. Hope not everyone fell asleep, but uh, the videos are out there. And uh, if there is time, I could show a video now, which which basically could be rounding up uh, what I was speaking about. There was a lot of repetition I realized with regards to certain measures, but since they are not so well known, it's it's not too bad. I hope, and uh, it helps a little bit to understand. We as FIFA are not at the end of the line. There's many, many more things that I don't know yet, probably, that will be in place in the U.S. at the World Cup, uh, Mexico, Canada, but also next year with the gender-neutral toilets, for example, that we didn't have before. In certain stadiums in Australia and New Zealand, hopefully. We already have Melbourne that agreed to it. Uh, so we will have the first one. And that's always, for me, as a change maker, a hook. If one tournament, uh, we, we, we feed something in there, we can assess that and turn it into a standard mechanism in place. So this topic is evolving. We are learning all the time. We are not inventing these, these things. All these things are coming up because there are experts that, that found out about them. FIFA sitting in Zurich with old white men uh, don't have the solution. Sometimes we know a little bit, but 
we cannot do that without the international community. So in the end, as it's not really easy to embed um, 